Things. Side two. Yeah. You know, on a on a on a less um, on a less yeah. noticeable scale. Right, right. No, that's why I think that what happens in, in this type of situation is that there are. Uh, you see, the roles <coughs> actually what happened. The roles were not defined, and there was really no time to define roles. Uh, when I came to the operation, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I had been working with J uh, JDC uh, as a secretary of administrative assistance. And uh, this wasn't at all what I did. I started getting involved in, in, in all all the facets of JDC activities. So you were really unprepared for the task that uh, now confronted you? Yeah, well, I was. I, of course I wasn't prepared. I wasn't... Uh, well, don't you think I was I not a social worker, well, but, it yeah, okay. but I think if it's not too, too immodest to say that, I was of, uh, of uh, I played an important role in the JC activities, not in, in the uh, area where I was trained, but of necessity I assumed other roles and uh, carried them out. But that's but, more by chance. But the there fact was no. You, to, you, you grew with the job. You developed, etc. But, or you had certain uh, abilities. Well, well I, first of all, I had been with JDC for years before that. I, I worked with JDC in, in Paris before the war. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, New York. For, well, over four years, uh, between the time I came to the States and I went overseas, mm -hmm. so I was very familiar with JDC activities and uh, the demands on its services. Mm -hmm. But um, wh what I would say, there really had been no such situation before. Nobody was prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Neither we nor the chaplains, because this was unique. I, you know, you can't compare it to any other situation. A, a social worker who maybe uh, handles a certain section of the population in a certain in a certain area in a certain city is certainly not prepared to handle the uh, the enormous problems that existed at the time. You feel there was no uh, way of, uh, of uh, teaching these people or preparing them in any way for the possible problems that they might encounter? I don't know. I don't think anybody knew the problems they might encounter. I mean, it was such an unprecedented uh, uh. It's difficult for me to see that simply because, uh, uh, from my own research, um, I found that information was was available in, in great abundance. Oh, information about, was ab about the situation in Europe. Yes, information was available at that time because JDC had representatives who sent report after report after report. But that isn't the same thing as when you are suddenly confronted okay. with a. Uh, mass of people, every single one of whom had a fantastically uh, a cruel story to relate. I mean, what can you, what can you tell about a, a woman that I remember now in Munich who had lost both her legs due to privation suffered in, in um, the camps. She had, uh, you know, frostbites and whatnot. She had lost all her family and uh, husband, children, brothers, I don't know. She was completely despondent. There was really, literally, nothing that would solace her. I remember that I tried to get a car for her through the offices of the Jewish representative by the um, Bavarian government so that she could be more mobile. She walked um, with great difficulties, and we would have succeeded except that she committed suicide before we managed, mm -hmm. because there was just nothing for her to live for anymore. Uh, people who had lost their families, I don't know whether anybody told you the story at the beginning, the very first displaced persons were sheltered in a museum, the Deutsche Museum, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know whether it was preserved, but the very first efforts of people to find their families were names scrawled on the walls. Uh, 
th that was something that that was so I mean unbelievable and, and, and I don't think there was ever a situation like this before and the impact was absolutely unpredictable. I don't think anybody was prepared for it. I really don't. I remember I'm a, I'm a pretty sensible and, and uh, fairly stable person but I remember that at one point uh, in the early days I uh, I said to Levi Becker uh, I think I have to return home. He said what happened? I said I don't know I was very despondent and finally I said you know, I think I have I've had to say no too many times. Mm -hmm. You know you reach the point where there's so little you can do because what did people want? Take the next plane and go to the States or, or the next ship and go to Israel. It wasn't possible. We couldn't do it. There was mm. So the frustrations were so um, heavy on all of us, every one of us. Uh, I'm not talking about the displaced persons. That's, that you can't even describe. I'm no. talking about us who were yeah. confronted with, uh, with it because even simple things, are, uh, some of them we could help. There was a little old lady, a German Jewish woman who had lost, uh, apparently uh, had been in quite uh, comfortable circumstance, had lost everything and lived in a little furnished room somewhere very, very um, primitively. And uh, s through somebody I got a an electric heating plate for her so that she could warm up some food and she thought that sort of the world had suddenly opened up for her you know little mm. things like that it was so poignant to see what it meant to a woman who had been in such um, probably lived in luxury before but suddenly a little thing like that meant to her all these things were so um, they were difficult to live with, very difficult. Because there was there were not isolated instances, they came upon you day after day, every minute of the day. Mm -hmm. And this is why I say nobody could have prepared for it. There was no preparation. You know what you do in a situation, uh, I, I don't know why I, I talk about social workers, but normally social situations are handled by social workers. But they know what they can do in, an in, in a certain instance, in a certain case. They, they have a certain form that they go by, certain guidelines. There were no guidelines. There were no instructions that you could follow because situations like that had never existed before. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to, uh, to establish sort of our own guidelines, what we could do, what we couldn't do. I remember one instance where um, there were a, a goodly number of TB patients and uh, they all of course wanted to go to Switzerland because in Europe at the time the only cure anybody knew for TB was to go to a sanatorium in Switzerland and uh, we already had uh, penicillin here and medications that could be used and uh, the medical people in in the states uh, did not think that uh, that was a necessary answer or an answer at all. Mm. And in order to make it, uh, we couldn't handle all the requests. There just was no place for them. So we one day we got instructions from our headquarters not to handle any cases of people going to Switzerland. Switzerland was out. And uh, so, of course, we had to live by these guidelines. And somebody came and wanted to go to Switzerland or you know, TB. He, he had not heard about the possibility of being cured elsewhere and found it, of course, very difficult to accept. One day I was confronted with the following situation. That was at the time when Sam Haber was the director already. And he was at a conference in Paris, which left me in charge of the operation. And uh, a woman came, very distraught. She had a son who was 18 months old. 
and he had developed signs of puberty of both sexes at that early age. He had uh, developed breasts, on the other hand a very deep uh, male voice and other signs. It, it, it was a very complex situation. And um, one of our nurses, JTC nurse, a public health nurse, came in with her and she um, uh, explained to me and she documented uh, uh, cases of uh, where a doctor in Switzerland had developed a cell that could help such cases. But it could ad be administered only in his own clinic in Switzerland. And uh, apparently time was a very um, determining factor. <coughs> and um, what, the, uh, what the woman wanted was mainly uh, that we uh, gave guarantee to the Swiss consul so that he would issue a visa and also, you know, help her defray the cost of the time. And so I took it upon myself to do so. I said, well, you know, there is nothing I can do. I couldn't reach Sam, uh, who was at that conference and unavailable. And uh, it was difficult to get through on the telephone anyway, and I decided that I take the responsibility. And later on, our medical director, Bill Schmidt, uh, fully approved of it. But I had no way of contacting him either at the time, you know, as I would have done normally because of that. Uh, the fact that they were both absent from the office in some hotel where they uh, very uh, important conference was going on. And uh, so, it, it, it's, it's, who's prepared for a situation like that? Who knows? You had to make a decision on the spot very often. Mm -hmm. And it might have been a, a, a decision that was contrary to instructions, as it was in that case. And yet it was the right decision. So uh, I don't think anybody could have been prepared for it. I don't think there was such a thing. Today, maybe, we, we, we might have, God forbid, it should happen, a similar situation again. Maybe we know a, bit, a little more about it. But I doubt it's a no, uh, but at least you know that it once happened before, so it might happen again, but you've seen the pictures, I'm sure you have seen the yeah. pictures of people, how what they looked like when they came out of the concentration camp. Was anybody prepared for that? You have, I'm sure you have talked to chaplains who were there, who went into the camps at first. They were not prepared for it. Not, but, of course not. But they should have been aware of the possibility, and many of them seen Of seeing people in that, in that, uh, I don't know. There were pictures in the press in America. It's a different story when you see the picture. When you see no, no question. I was it. talking of what, what, what was known. I went to Dachau with a group when one of the Biddles. One of the who? Of the Biddles, you know, the... Um, Ambassador. Yeah, yeah. There were several, and I, I, I don't remember offhand which one. I don't remember his first name. But uh, uh, he came to Germany and wanted to see Dachau, and I was not going with him. And he should have been prepared, should he not? Because, as you said, there were pictures in the press. The man was so shaken. Literally. We all were. You can't visualize it when you don't see it. When you see suddenly in OVNI and you know people, human beings, were burnt in there. It just seems a bit strange that, that I can understand that the individuals may have found it difficult that once they confronted it, but an organization, uh, it seems to me, should be um, prepared to go in with food, they should have gone in with, uh, with experienced people. That, uh, well, to the extent that it was possible, I'm, I'm sure we did. There were experienced people. I remember that in the very, uh, even during the war, before the war was over, uh, 
Rubens. No, what was his name? God, my, my memory is really getting bad, getting old. And uh, Jake Taub yeah. went in early. Right. Uh, I remember that in the uh, in the uh, days. God, this was long before the war was actually over. Uh, I used to read the reports, mm -hmm. and uh, one day I talked to Joe Schwartz and to Moe Levitt, and I said, you know, that they, they sent reports that they need people to help them and so on. And uh, I was, I wanted to go, I wanted to volunteer. And I was not an American citizen then. So Joe Schwartz explained to me that it was very difficult to get Americans into these get permission for Americans to go in, much less for uh, people who were not citizens yet. And, uh, um, so the uh, to get people in and to find the right people to go in, people willing to go. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was a military situation that was, that was uh, I suppose, the overriding uh, concern of the government at the time, and uh, that put some restrictions on the uh, on the organizations, whom they could send in and what they could do. It put a great deal of restrictions on them. Do you remember anything, any discussions whatsoever on the part of individuals in the, in the JDC that uh, uh, this is a problem, but because the Jews have been treated the worst, therefore we should uh, ask the government to allow us to be the first in with the military? to try to help and to I save? Know. I wouldn't know what those discussions took place on that level. No, no. that I couldn't tell. But um, then uh, I remember that that, that was uh, early in August. Um, I think it was then more Levitt, uh, Joe Schwartz was not in New York then, who called me and asked me whether I still want to go, and I said yes. and. Uh, so then, you know, he said, get your papers ready, we, have, we want you to go now. And it was, took me a while uh, to get my re-entry permit, which I needed and all this. It wasn't that simple, you know, to go in. And subsequently, in 19, I, I uh, left uh, the States on a re-entry permit, which expired in October 1946, and I had to be back before that. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I applied for my citizenship papers because you can apply for it only after five years of residence, which were then up. It took me seven months to get it, and only after the ADC made strong intervention with the, uh, I suppose it was Department of State at the time, mm -hmm. Department of Immigration and Naturalization under the jurisdiction of the Justice Department, uh, I wouldn't have gotten it. So uh, there are innumerable reasons why things were very, very difficult. I mean, this isn't. No, I understand what you're saying. And it's uh, an isolated case of an of an one of the people involved, uh, which may not have been that significant. But you multiply that by any number of of, of uh, impediments, and then when I finally did go back, I was held up in Paris for several weeks because I had to have military clearance again to go to mm -hmm. go back into Germany, and that was not available. Mm -hmm. So. And during all this time, I was supposed to be in Germany working, but I couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. So uh, today, you know, I think about it very often. Like I, when I travel, I have been going to Europe every year, and uh, you know, you go from one country to the other without even being accosted by anybody, whether you about your passport or whatever. You know, it's very casual now. But when I remember the difficulties in those days of providing a, a, a little piece of paper, we used to do our own, and it, you know we, we had a stamp made up, and the people referred to it as settle mit der Stempel. You know what that means? Yeah. A little a slip yeah. of paper with a, with an official stamp. Yeah. That was sometimes sufficient to get people out or into another zone. Difficulties. Let's talk about difficulties. Why people couldn't do what they wanted to do. Um, one of our men was going into Italy 
to pick up supplies, fruit, vegetables, things, with a, with a truck. And I was going to Italy also I, for some purpose. And uh, we passed, no, I think it was before we left. Somehow, we were asked to take a little boy along, nine year old, I believe, who was left alone. The family was dispersed, and it was found after you know a great deal of, of uh, correspondence that his father was in Italy, and his father had a visa to go to the states. But he couldn't come to pick up his son. His son he couldn't come to him because of difficulties of crossing borders. They had no papers. So we smuggled the boy into Italy. We just simply did. I remember that we crossed the f border. This is not a border of a country, a border of a zone, from the American zone into the French zone. Mm -hmm. And I happen to speak French quite fluently. So the officer in charge at the, at the French border, I started talking to him and told him a fantastic story of this boy. And he finally, and of course, all this was accompanied, as was the custom in those days, by generous offerings of cigarettes in the course of the conversation. And uh, finally he said, uh, oh, I don't understand the whole story, go ahead already, you know, sort of that kind of thing. And we got the boy in, into the French zone and then into Innsbruck and so on. But this, this was a kind of difficulty that you experienced over and over and over again, mm. for which there could be no rules. Where would, did I read that I smuggled this boy into Italy? I, I just decided I did, because it needed to be done, right? Um, I'm sure that other people did similar things, and I'm sure the chaplains did. I'm sure, but we don't know the individual stories. I don't think I have told this, I just came to mind. So we all did things that we thought needed to be done. There may have been in, in instances we may have done things wrong, but it was all done to help people and it eventually did in one way or other help people. Um, and it wasn't always, I don't know, you told me that you talked to, to Jack Levine? Uh, I'm, I didn't get to see him, I'm going to see him. Oh, because I remember uh, when Jack originally came here, he wasn't at all happy here at the beginning. He was lonesome, he had lost his family and all this. And in fact, he sort of said, you know, you made me come here, more or less. Of course, he's very grateful that we did. Mm -hmm. But um, it isn't all... Uh, I don't know how one can ever get the whole story because there are too many angles to it. As you say, you'd, you'd uh, uh, touch it from the point of view of the chaplains and Abe from the point of view of the JDC staff and other people from the point of view of the organization per se and, and probably somebody from the point of view of UNRWA and somebody else from the point of view of the army or whatever. And each one perhaps reads different because mm -hmm. each one gives his own interpretation. But. Uh, I don't know whether you want to know or whether you want me to talk about this. Has nothing. Well, it it it, uh, it involves her her Friedman too. The way I mentioned the the situation in Augsburg. What happened is that there were Landsberg was one of the camps, and um, at one point uh, several inhabitants of Landsberg got into a fight with some Germans and beat them up. And 19 of them were arrested, 19 young fellows from mm -hmm. Landsberg. And they were brought before a military tribunal for um, sentencing or for trial, whatever. Um, and I don't remember, was it under? I think that was when Lady Becker was still there. 
and Levi was absent because somebody had been murdered somewhere and he had to go there, in Stuttgart, I believe. And uh, we got a call from military government asking us whether we could provide a translator who knew German, English and Yiddish. And uh, I didn't have anybody. I had a young man, uh, one of the displaced persons, but he was out of town at that particular day. He couldn't find him. He worked also for military intelligence part of the town or something like that. And uh, so he was away. And so I said, well, I'll have to come myself. I will be the interpreter. And uh, so I went to Augsburg the morning. I think it was the following day. And uh, it was another one of those terribly difficult situations because the military um, tribunal were, of course, American officers who maybe were sympathetic but unfamiliar mm -hmm. with the situation and, again, unprepared. They asked questions which I had to relate to these young fellows. And the questions were such that my impulse was to say, for God's sake, how can you ask that, you know, rather than interpret it and ask the fellow. For instance, the question was, what's your name and this, where do you come from, where do you, where do you now live, why are you in Germany? Ask a young man who had been taken to a concentration camp, why is he in Germany? You rebel against it, you want to say, don't be stupid, what do you ask that for? But because I couldn't do that. And this went on 19 times. And that, of course, was not the only question, you know very personal questions which they had to ask. I certainly don't find any fault with the, with the judges. They had to ask it. But when you are involved in it, and that, uh, of course, the same uh, thing happened with the Germans. The Germans were asked, the witnesses, you know, and all these questions had to be laid verbatim to the witnesses, to the accused, and their answers had to be laid verbatim to the judges. And I remember that day as one of the most difficult because it was so um, emotionally frustrating to have to ask these questions, you know, although they were not my questions, but to the young fellows who asked that question, it was as if I had asked them. So how do I ask him, uh, what are you doing in Germany, why are you in Germany, what's your father's name, where is your father, where is your mother? They didn't know somewhere in, in, in a concentration camp in an oven, who knows? It, it is unbelievably difficult. Mm -hmm. Is anybody prepared for a situation like that? I don't think so. I don't think anybody can. And that was uh, that was one of the occasions when uh, I met Herb Friedman. He was at the trial. And, It was a three-day trial. I, I was there only for the first day. The second, third day, I found this young man and sent him in because, you know, I really had a work to do that I couldn't postpone for three days. Mm -hmm. But, um, no, I, uh, I think – Well, I think you've answered uh, the, uh, the point that I, I was really uh, making. Was there anything else that you wanted to know? Don't get me started. I, I start, once I start talking, I don't start. start. No, I, um, whatever you want to know, I'd be glad to answer, but. Well, I think you've answered uh, mostly. Uh, unless there's anything else about the, uh, the chaplains and uh, what you may have seen them doing, etc. No, I, uh, I really, I don't think I can uh, can add much to that particular uh, chapter. Okay. Yeah. Although I will not, I don't think I want to join the cause of those who, as you say, say that, that the chaplains didn't do enough. 
I think they're very helpful, but I can't give you examples. I can't give you um, cases. Okay, fine.